vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. And a highway will be there. It will be called the way of, lo- of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor will any ferocious beast get up on it. They will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. The New Testament lesson is found in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 to 43, page 779 in your pew Bible. Peter sums up Jesus' ministry as he preaches to Cornelius' household. Acts 10, beginning at verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with his Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The gospel lesson is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 8. Would you please rise for the reading of the gospel? Verses 28 through 34 are found on page 686 in the Pew Bible. Matthew 8, beginning at verse 28. Uh, After healing many of the diseased and calming a storm, Jesus also heals two men of demonic possession. Matthew 8, 28. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Here is the reading of the lessons. You may be seated. Sometimes the President of the United States is referred to as the most powerful man in the world, and occasionally we have discussions about who that person might be. Nowadays, recently, uh, some have put forth the suggestion that maybe Vladimir Putin is the most powerful man in the world. And talk goes, maybe it was Napoleon in his day, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, and everybody has their idea who was the greatest. 
but none of these are or all of them put together can't hold a candle to Jesus Christ, the greatest man who ever lived. And certainly he was God, but he was true man. And all human greatness put together can't begin to compare to the greatness of our God, of our Lord and Savior, our King Jesus Christ. The Sermon on the Mount ended this way in Matthew chapter 7. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Power, authority, that's the way Jesus spoke. And in Matthew chapter 8, he acted with power and authority. It's deeds that show that same power and authority. And as we read through the chapter in verses 1 through 4, we see his power over the leper, the disease of leprosy. He healed the leper. And in following verses, he healed a Roman centurion's servant. And going on, he heals Peter's mother-in-law. And all these sicknesses, Jesus showed his power over all sickness and disease in chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. There's nothing that Jesus could not do. No disease he could not heal. Leprosy was a terrible thing. All contact uh, between uh, the living and the lepers were forbidden. They were given up as dead. In fact, some people even held funeral services for them. Didn't matter to Jesus, he touched them. Didn't make him unclean, it made the leper clean. Didn't matter to Jesus who he healed. The Roman centurion's uh, servant, you know, Gentile, Hated race, people that were oppressing your own nation. Jesus healed him as well. Healed, healed Peter's mother-in-law. All these people, Jesus showed uh, that it didn't matter who you were. If you came to him in faith, he could heal your disease. Going on through the chapter in verse 23 through 27, Jesus shows his power over nature. He calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee, the Lake Galilee, which by the Jews was called a sea. It's all the same to them, but sometimes the storms were so bad that it did resemble a sea. The wind would come swooping down through the valleys that created kind of, a, there's valleys that was a, a hole in the, in the mountains all around the sea, and so the, it'd be just like a wind tunnel, and winds would come down and create waves that would swamp any boat. And that's the kind of storm that the disciples found themselves in. Experienced sailors were terrified for their lives. And yet Jesus showed his power, his authority over nature by calming that storm. It showed him, he showed himself to be Lord and God in that miracle alone. In Psalm 65, this is written, You answer us with awesome deeds of righteousness, O God our Savior, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who formed the mountains by your power, having armed yourself with strength, who stilled the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the turmoil of the nations. Those living far away fear your wonders. And so God is identified as the one who stills the seas, and Jesus did that very thing. And so when the disciples asked even the wind who what kind of man is this even the winds and waves obey him they soon found their answer when jesus rose from the dead the man who was god become a man that's who stills the storms in verses 28 through 34 jesus showed his power over demons over all the spiritual world can you imagine this guy or these two guys in matthew's gospel have so many demons in, in the other Gospels, we uh, hear that their name was Legion, for we are many. And this herd of 2,000 pigs rushed down to their deaths into the lake because there were that many demons. And yet Jesus, with just a word, drove them out. Can you imagine the, the power and the authority it takes to command such an army? And what gratitude these men must have felt as they received their deliverance. But Jesus showed his power in the victory over all these demons. Jesus has all power.
power and all authority. And all these together show that Jesus has power over everything, most especially over the root cause of all evil, which is sin. Everything that's wrong in the world, whether it's sickness and disease, whether it's demon possession, whether it's storms of life, whatever problem there is, it can be traced back to the fall. We all, like sheep, have gone astray and we had our beginnings with Adam and Eve. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And yet, Jesus Christ has power and authority even over that. Jesus, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Throughout his life, that's what he did, was show his power and authority. He spoke with authority. He acted with authority. He had power over all things. So what are some take-home lessons we might get from this chapter, from Jesus demonstrating his almighty power? First of all, I want to highlight the fact that Jesus wants to help you. I think a lot of times we can identify with that leper. He said, Lord, if you want to, you can help me. Not too many of us doubt that God has the power to do whatever he wants to. But we may doubt if he is willing to. We may doubt that God wants us, wants to help me, that God even cares about me or that he may even not know that I exist. But God does know. The Psalms say he records our tears in a bottle. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his, his saints. God loves each and every one of you. And God wants to help you. One of the verses I love most is Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is on my side. I shall not fear. What can anyone do to me? But that first phrase, the Lord is with me. The Lord is on my side. How precious to keep that thought in mind. God loves you. He wants to help you. If you want to, Lord, you can make me clean. Jesus said, if you, though you are sinful, know how to give good gifts to your children, will not your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who cry out to him day and night? And we have the greatest proof of all of God's love for us and Christ's love for us. In Romans 5, 8, the Bible says, God showed his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us the supreme sacrifice to save us from ourselves, basically, to save us from our own sin that we willingly committed so that we can be made perfect again, so that we can enter into heaven and enter into perfect fellowship of love. And Paul goes on to write in Romans chapter 8 about the great love that God has for us, about what he's done for us, about how much he longs for us to be with him, not only us, but all of creation. And toward the end of chapter 8, Paul sums up saying this, What shall we say in response? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with, a, along with him, graciously give us all things? The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Jesus wants to help you. Secondly, the kingdom of heaven is open to all. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, or what you're doing. You can go through that narrow gate. You can enter the kingdom of heaven. One of the things that's neat about that narrow gate, it indicates we receive individual attention from God. In the Old Testament, as people were uh, gathering their tithes or to take their tithe out of the flock because they all pretty much were farmers, they had sheep and goats and so forth, they were instructed to pass their herds through the gate 
and count as they touched each one with their rod. And every tenth one was their tithe. That was what belonged to God. But each individual sheep received attention. Each individual was important. And so it is with us. Doesn't matter who we are or where we're from, that gospel in a nutshell, God loved the world so much he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's faith that's the qualifying factor, not our ethnic background, where we live, who we are, our gender. None of these things make any difference. Whether or not we come to Jesus in faith makes all the difference. Some people that were following Jesus because he was a miracle worker, they asked him, what does God want us to do? What does he really want of us? What is the work of God? And Jesus said this, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. The Bible really only recognizes two types of people in the world, those who trust in Jesus Christ and those who don't. That's the only distinction for all practical purposes that we need ever make. The kingdom of heaven is open to all, to anyone who has faith. As the hymn said that we began with, have faith in God, he will protect you. Thirdly, Jesus will calm all the storms in your life. Sometimes we might feel like he's sleeping in the back of the boat. We might feel like he doesn't know there's a storm. Maybe we feel like he missed the boat altogether. But he's there. He, as I mentioned earlier, he promised, I am with you always. He didn't even say I will be. I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's a promise we have. And even though he may, it may seem to us like he's asleep in the back of the boat, Yet, he will calm that storm. You notice none of the disciples perished in that storm. They all thought they were going to. How often do we think ahead and it's like, oh my gosh, if something doesn't happen pretty soon, I'm done for. How many times have you thought that in your life by now? 100, 200, 300? And yet, the Lord always has come through. Here we are. We're all here today. God has come through. He calms our storms. And even if we're in the midst of it, well, how far ahead can you see in a storm? At Christmas time when we went up to Missouri and we were coming back and it rained the whole way back and we got back and found out it rained nine and a half inches here. But you know, the whole time we were driving, we couldn't see more than 100 feet ahead of us hardly. The rain was that hard. We can't see clearly during a storm. But God can. God knows everything. And He's on our side. He's with us. He wants to help us. He will calm that storm. Again, in John chapter 6, the Lord Jesus promised, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. God always welcomes you. And if He welcomes you, He will keep you and preserve you and give you what you need. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, a well-known verse, and I know many of you love that verse and take comfort in it, but it's a verse we need to remind ourselves of a lot. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, not the least of which is the temptation to give up, the temptation to throw up our hands in despair and say, oh, the heck with it. Where is God when I needed him? He's still there in the boat. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Doesn't say that you won't have trials. Doesn't say that things won't be hard occasionally. But it does say he won't let it get out of control for you. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. 
God will calm your storm. If we trust in him, if we call on him, and if we persevere, the storm will be stilled. And then finally, the fourth point I want to emphasize for today, in my outline at the beginning, I, I've kind of highlighted verses 1 through 17, and 23 through 27, and 28 through 34. And if you kind of was looking at numbers, you might think, well, hey, what happened to verses 18 through 22? He left that out. Jesus showed his power over sicknesses in that first part. He showed his power over nature. He showed his power over demons. But what did he do in that middle part? He's calling us to share with him in that. We have the episode when two disciples, these people were already disciples. They weren't the 12, but there were lots of people following him. They also were called disciples. The first one said, teacher, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Will you follow him no matter where he leads? Jesus has all authority. He loves you. He will help you. He will calm your storms. Will you follow him? Will you trust him? Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And what a lot of us don't realize in this day and age was that his father was not dead yet. He was perfectly healthy in all probability. What that meant was, I can't follow you now until my dad is gone. Once I've done that duty of seeing that he's properly buried, then I'll come and follow you. Then I'll be free. Then I'll be my own person. But not until my parents die. The Bible says now is the day of salvation. Jesus said, whoever loves me and follows me, I will give him a hundred times as much fathers, mothers, children, property, fields, and eternal life. But Jesus also said, whoever wants to follow me must carry his own cross must deny himself. Whoever loves his father and mother, his children, his home, his fields, more than me is not worthy of me, Jesus said. Will you follow me now? Will you follow me before all these others? Will you follow me no matter what the cost? Because you see, the cost of discipleship, it's high. It's everything that we have and are. But the cost of non-discipleship is even higher. What can a get man give in exchange for a soul? Jesus said. If he doesn't follow me, he's lost. That's a cost we can't afford to pay. But I noticed also in those verses, we don't know what those two guys did. We don't know if they stayed with Jesus or not. Did the one guy go home and stay home and then try again to join later? But Jesus had already died. He wasn't there anymore. Did he stay a follower? What about the other one? Was he able to give up his home? Was he able to give up the comforts of a good life? He was a scribe, a teacher of the law. He had it made. He had a good life. <coughs> Did he follow Jesus? uncertain of what tomorrow might bring. What's your answer? Will you follow Jesus no matter what? That's what he's calling us to. And like, just like in this chapter, it's an open question. It's an open, chapter, open question for us too. We might be following him today. Are we going to follow tomorrow? Have you made that commitment to follow Jesus no matter what? And however he sends you. In Mark, this same man who was healed of all these demons, the legion of demons, he wanted to follow Jesus. Jesus sent him home. He said, no, go tell among your neighbors what the Lord has done for you. Jesus can take you 
away from your home, He can send you to be faithful in your home. But what matters is that we're sold out to Him. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And His reason is because God wants everyone to be saved and to come to know the truth. That's His overarching purpose. Will you follow Him? Seek first the kingdom of God, Jesus said. And all these other things that you need will be given you as well. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Paul said. Will you follow Christ no matter what the cost? Jesus has shown us that he is worthy of all that we have and are. He made us. He knows our frame. He knows who we are and what we are. And He knows our needs. Will you, by your words and by your deeds, beg Jesus to go as those farmers did who's, who lost their pigs to the demons? Or will you follow Him as did the disciples, no matter what? To know Jesus is to know peace, to have life. But if you don't know Jesus, you don't have life or peace. May we know Jesus and follow him to the end of our days, no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing you.